So I think we can start with our afternoon session. As you see, we have two, two papers. The first one, uh, which is called Sacred Landscape Through the Eyes of the Medieval Building, will be delivered by Martin F. Lechard. Uh, who is um, one of our students of Brno, who just finished his master thesis, and uh, tomorrow he will apply to become also a PhD student. So it's in the between, he's a sort of liminality. Yeah. And he used this liminality um, <laughs> for this building, which experience, which was a double liminal zone for him. That's true. And he wrote his uh, master thesis about the Tower of Torba in uh, northern Italy, and made in the beginning of the 19th century. Cycle images and frescoes, and he is right now submitting an article about this topic to Arte Lombarda since it's like a very Lombard subject. And he also participated several on our past project. He wrote in the small book we did on Balkany. He participated also to major, let's say, traveling. And his uh, project, his PG project, is um, linked to the interaction between liturgy and um, space in the realm of the 8th and 9th century, so special liturgy and, um, and I would say object, images and ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked him to work for this collective project about uh, migrating art historians about the landscape because it's something, as, as we will see, which is for the pilgrim maybe the first question. Before everything, before the buildings, before everything you are doing, you are meeting landscape in the spending a lot of your time in the middle of the countryside. So therefore, I asked him to do it, and I will let him speak. Okay. So thank you for this beautiful introduction. I'm very humbled and happy that I have this opportunity to speak to you all today in the very proximity of Mont Saint Michel, at the end of our pilgrimage, about this topic of sacred landscape. And it was actually, actually it was the walking uh, in the previous years, but also during these four months that led me and I think all of us to the realization that churches and cathedrals are very often like harmoniously settled into the countryside, into the natural landscape. And it was this experience which really led to the formulation of the topic uh, of the topic of the sacred landscape and as how and how it was viewed th through the eyes of a medieval pilgrim. Well, when I was first thinking about this, I was, I had in my mind actually an object uh, which has been invested with sacred and put into the landscape. So I've started from the object, which was art historic approach, just specifically. And from that, from that position, I've also started to ask the question, questions as how did the object could, could change the landscape? How was it perceived from the long distance? view uh, how this experience of a pilgrim when he was watching the object from a long distance view could actually change and transform his experience when he was next to it afterwards. How the expectation of a pilgrim could be changed um, through this. And these questions, I have to be honest, they aroused, of course, curiosity, but also fear and, and anxiety. And the, this fear was caused by the fact that as an art historian, I'm used to be as, as close to the object as possible. Um, and in this case, I was not able to use... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, my presentation is going, but I don't want it to go. So I will just go a little back. Yeah, as an art historian, I'm, yeah, I'm used to be as close to the object as possible. And in this case, I was not able to, do, to use the classical methodology, like the formal analysis or iconographic analysis. I was too far from it, unable to touch it, and unable to like, really uh, observe detailed structures of the, of the churches or portals or whatever. But this also led me uh, to allow, allowed me to think about this subject in different connotations, to approach it differently. And it was again the walking which led me to the realization that if a pilgrim would see some beautiful like church or bell tower in the distance, like once or two times during the day, he might consider himself really lucky because usually it would be only nature which would surround you, uh, in which you would be like enclosed. And 
I've realized that it is truly uh, that to understand what the, what the church or cathedral means in the distance, you would also have to understand what nature itself means. And of course, it's a really complex topic. And I will be speak about it later, but <coughs> I will try to approach it in, in a certain way. But, okay, so the pilgrim would, be, pilgrim would be enclosed by a nature which was cultivated or sometimes really wild. And, uh, and this led me then to the following questions, how the nature was perceived, how the nature could change uh, the perception of an object which has been enclosed by it, how even to the questions of if the God, uh, it, if it was possible to approach God only through the nature, and finally also to the question of why object also. So very complex topics which, yeah, which, as I, which I cannot of course cover all of those, which are really difficult to cover. But this was my lines of ideas which created finally this presentation and this following structure, which more than like final result of my research will present like its preliminary state. So I hope that you will be kind and I'm waiting for your uh, like remarks on, on, on the subject. So the first I will be speaking today about, the, about what a medieval pilgrim could truly see around himself which this is the no, some notions might be blurring our minds about this, so I will just clear this up. Then I will just touch a topic of the uh, really perceiving the nature and seeing nature in mid Middle Ages. Uh, I, will, I will try to do it through the literary description of nature uh, from, from Middle Ages, which is uh, through analysis of two topoi, locus amenus and locus horribilis. Well, then I will do the, this little detour into the question of, of approaching God into the landscape just really shortly, but I think it's necessary to at least touch this question. And finally, I will be back again with the object and with the church or cathedral in the distance and what it really might signify for a medieval, medieval person. So let's start with the, how did the landscape truly look like? Well, mm, it seems to me that we are obliged to dismantle at least two, two notions or two images uh, of medieval landscape which might be blurring our mind thanks to this mediation of 19th century Middle Ages or, or 19th century idea of Middle Ages. And the first of those is the idea of, of churches and cathedrals everywhere, that it was only these structures which had been put it into the landscape and nothing else. And I, don't, I found like two text medieval ones which might be uh, essential for construction this image. And first of those is the, uh, is the text of Rodolfus Glaber uh, from the first half of the 11th century. And he's writing about this, I will, I will read it for you. It, uh, he's writing in his words, just before the third year after the millennium throughout the whole world, men began to reconstruct churches, although for the most part, the existing ones were properly built and not in the least unworthy. It was as if the whole world were shaking itself free, shrugging off the burden of the past and cladding itself everywhere in the white mantle of churches. So he's speaking about this massive rebuilding of ecclesiastical buildings. And then the second text, uh, which might be also instrumental in this forming, in this informing of this like false idea, is the text of William of Malmesbury. It's from the 12th century. And William is writing here about the, uh, the situation in England after the Battle of, Battle of Hastings after 1066. Uh, and he's writing, Normans revived by their arrival the observances of religion which were everywhere grown lifeless in England. You might see churches rise in every village and monasteries in the towns and cities built after a style unknown before. So again, just churches and, and cathedrals everywhere. But we must bear in mind an archaeologist, historians and also some objects and depictions from the 11th century might uh, demonstrate that it was not like that. That it was much, as we all know, it was much more complex. There has been, for example, one of my favorite objects ever, the Biobrodery, can show us that there, there was also the fortified structures, the palaces for the kings to settle in. There was also the smaller rural buildings. Um, so it was, to sum up, it was not just the ecclesiastical building. So that was the first notion of the 19th century idea about Middle Ages. And the second one, it's the, con it's the, it's the notion of virgin uh, forest, or it's also called 
old growth forest old wi or wild wood. And it is uh, the idea that this kind of deep forest has been uh, uh, surrounded all the inhabited places uh, in the Middle Ages. But, uh, and this idea actually suggests that the human beings in the Middle Ages were unable to cultivate their surroundings, the nature around them, which is again a little bit false because as we know, uh, it was not like that, as I will show you. But I want to tell you now that the, this notion has been is present in art historical, art historical books from the 70s. I found the books which really work with this really vivid idea of, uh, yeah, of this kind of uh, Im image of Middle Ages landscape. But it's also present in like historical novels. I like this Ivanhoe or Sir Walter Scott from the 1820, and. It's also present in the today's contemporary sci-fi and fantasies, books, literature, but also games and movies. Here I will be quoting uh, this, uh, this book called Timeline of Michael Crichton, who is, um, it's about the time travel, Kate, and she's getting into the year 1337, and she's describing the landscape as follows. So Kate, she became aware of a clear demarcation between the relatively small areas of human habitation, towns and fields, and the surrounding forest, a dense, vast green carpet stretching away in all directions. In this landscape, the forest predominated. She had the sense of encompassing wilderness in which human beings were interlopers. Again, in which the human being would not be actively involved, but only passively receiving the power of the nature. But in, for, this, for this kind of image, I think, uh, it was especially landscape archaeologists who would show, as Sam, Sam Turner, for example, who showed that, again, it was not like that, that usually, for example, there has been also the fields, as you can see in the lower register, and the land has been cultivated. And there has been also the road for a pilgrim to walk on, there has been the crosses in the landscape. Uh, furthermore, what is also important, that for the rebuilding of the ecclesiastical building, buildings of the 11th and 12th centuries, uh, there was a great necessity of stones and timber, of course. And in this sense, we can say that the, the woods which existed has not been wild and really like deep, but they were really cultivated for the timber, for this, for construction of, of cathedrals and so on. And also there has been the quarries for, uh, quarries where the stone has been mined. So for example, this is the image uh, of, of the landscape near Bar Bernac uh, in Cambridgeshire in, in, in England. And today it seems like really nicely, just really natural, filled only with natural phenomena, but actually it is the these ups and downs there, they are the results of the medieval mine stoning, so, or the stoning of, I don't know, mine stoning. Yeah. Uh, so to conclude this part, I just want to say that people were much more in control of their surrounding than, than we tend to imagine. And also that it was not only churches and cathedrals, but it was much more complex uh, uh, image of the landscape. So that's, I think, important before we will start to speak about the seeing nature or the, I, or the question of perception of nature in Middle Ages. And so how can we imagine that the medieval, medieval pilgrim could like perceive it? That perceive nature, which is in its uh, in its con in its con it's like really slippery con concept the nature itself it can be ordered and disordered construct and constructing and as you will see it, it can be also garden and wilderness but the last 20 years of research had shown that uh, as suggested actually that the nature is not as natural as it might seem that <laughs> the nature is actually dependent on us on our way of, of perceiving, of our way uh, of perceiving, yes, of seeing especially. And this seeing is in turn dependent on, on like the whole culture background behind us, on the culture histories and tradition of spatial perceptions. In other words, that these, these texts suggested that uh, nature is actually a human construction. And to understand it, we would have to understand, we would, we would have to try to study like this spatial perception, spatial representation of each culture, and also the pre-existing ways of these spatial, spatial representations, which is really the complex topics which I cannot 
cover here, but I can only refer to some books which try to deal with this topic. This is uh, from 2014, for example, Space in the Middle West, which could provide at least some ideas about this. Uh, what I will strive to do here is just to show one of the ways which could bring us closer to this cultural background of the Middle, middle Ages. And uh, I will not be dealing actually with much of images because it's understandable since there is not much images from 11th or 12th century which would be de de depicting nature or nature landscape. So I've decided to help, to find help in literature and in this uh, literary description of the, na of, of the landscape. Concrete, more specifically, I will be talking about Tutopoi, which had been used for it in Middle Ages, and the connotations which they bear, uh, Locus Amenus and Locus Horribilis. <clears throat> so, Locus Amenus, it's, in its translation it means pleasant place, <laughs> and it is actually a technical term uh, used in literary studies, um, and which has been introduced by er Ernst Curtius. And in his classic like, definition, it means um, it locus amenus forms the principal motive of all nature description from Roman Empire un until the 16th century. And it is usually characterized as this ideal, pleasant, shaded, shaded place, uh, which is comprised at least from some kind of water, which is spring or brooks, also trees and uh, and meadow, but it, the, this definition is not really that narrow. It's, it can sometimes be mountain can be added or some kind of breeze around or the sound of the birds around. So what is important though, it's that it has the classical tradition. And I have just one example of this from the Ovid's Metamorphosis, concretely of the, from the story of Orpheus. I, I've chosen it because it's really, I, you will see. So uh, in this story, it is said, there was a hill, high and beautiful with the green grass, and there was not any shade for comfort on the top. The bard struck such harmonies on his sweet lair that shade most grateful to the hill was spread around. Strong trees came up there. And now there is, this, there is the different type of trees listed who just came to this place. And it just is the story of creation of such a locus amenus, actually. It's a story uh, of creation, the place where Orpheus could finally create his poetry, where the shade would be, where the trees would be, also the beautiful meadow. So, but as we know, the, the idea of topos suggests continuity, and, but it is important to realize that uh, the context in which, it be, which, in which it is being used has changed, it is being transformed. So, it, is not sur it should not be surprising uh, that for, uh, that also early medieval or, or just the medieval Christian writers would be using this kind of topoi, for example, um, but they would be investing it with a new significance. Um, and here, I'm just, we must remember that for them, of course, the God was the creator of all the nature around them. Uh, and it was, and how else could they like, better describe such a place created by God and the cre by the using of this classical, classical tradition of, of describing uh, ideal, pleasant places. So in this sense, I'm, I'm just, I've just used this Augustine chapter from the city of God, which is called Upon Good Things That God Has Bestowed Upon This Miserable Life of Ours. It's a beautiful, beautiful title. And in this, he's... Uh, between those good things he speaks about the shades of the woods, the colors and smells of, the, of flowers, the numbers of birds and their varied hues and songs, the strange alternations in the color of the sea, now one green, then another, now blue, then purple. So it seemed that for Augustine, this one location of the locus amenus has spread into all creation, into all nature around him, as if uh, it, it became really this, this topos has been used as it was invested with the idea of terrestrial paradise, I think, as I understood it correctly. And uh, this paradise is again connected to the idea of garden, and it's, it's, it's connected with the idea as a place of the grateful contemplation and starting the mystical dialogue with the God himself. And as such, this kind of place has been uh, very often 
very often uh, used in some hagiographies from the 10th or 12th centuries. So for example, Rudesindus of Dumio lived in a pleasant valley with fountains to the streams, suitable for bringing forth flowers and herbs as well as fruit bearing trees. And also Konu Oyonus, also he lived surrounded by mountains with their steep slopes close to the sky. The most pleasant land provides gifts of all good things, predestined by God from eternity that it should forever be a house of prayer. So it is clearly uh, above mentioned Lodzi Ameni were considered by Christian writers as the perfect sites for contemplation and approaching the Creator. And uh, yeah, and they were associated with paradise. So that's the first of the topos. The second one is the locus horribilis. And as you can see from the, from the title itself, it is in stark contrast to the previous ones. Uh, it is the place of chaos and disorder. It is the place of horror also. And it is, uh, of course, there, it is filled with wild animals, wild beasts and also demons. And it is in contrast to this locus amenus because it, it's not really uh, arising, its origin is not classical one. It is actually Semitic one. The locus horribilis is uh, biblical wilderness. And uh, as such, it was not uh, discussed by an Ernst Curtius, the, the, the scholar which I've mentioned before, but uh, it was this locus horribilis, it has been recognized by different ecclesiastical historians as a very common place in the hagiography, very popular in the 11th and 12th century. And so in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, as I've said, this locus horribilis is associated with death, disorder, chaos, disobedience and testing. It is actually the cursed ground of thorns and thistles of Adam's exile. It is also uh, a uh, barren and howling waste of Moses' desert, the same desert in which, in, in which Christ is spending 40 days to, uh, in the temptation of the serpent, as St. Ambrose would write to reassemble mankind in the paradise. So, but with this Christ's action, this locus horribilis became also linked with the notion of purification and redemption. So it was suddenly uh, somehow paradoxical place. And, um, and it received some spiritual positive meaning. And as such, of course, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it is quite clear that also the first hermits would, would go into the desert, into this such wilderness uh, to fight there this, these demons and uh, to find also the place where they could, in, uh, they could really focus on the essentials, which is the... This, this dialogue with the God. And th these first hermits, it was, for example, the Antony the Great uh, in, in, the, in the third century and also the Cappadocian fathers. But uh, I have to say that it was not only the desert which became uh, this, the popular place uh, for such a retreat, um, because in the, in the West and the medieval West, which is of our the biggest concern here, um, it also, it spread this wilderness into the, this deep forest, this idea of Selva Oscura of Dante's, where you can also uh, like somehow reach these same, same ideals. And in this sense, I'm showing you this kind of hagiography, which was written in the 11th century. It is about the Rodingus, founder of Bollier en Argent, which we saw. And it is written, in his old age, Rodingus wanted to withdraw into solitude so that, remote from human companionship, he might more freely focus the eye of his mind on divine contemplation. He went out of the monastery and withdrew into a place of horror and vast solitude, not, from, not far from the monastery, hiding in the thickets of the forest. Well, it must be said that uh, this locus horribilis, as I've said, is a paradoxical place, but it also through cultivation, it can become garden. And this is also another motive which is present in the hagiographies. The cultivation might be spiritual, but also really material. So uh, here I have just a different example of this. Uh, 
a ple for Frodo, Fro Frodo Bertus, uh, this is like the, the text from the ten end of the 10th century, there was a place which was more suitable for beasts and serpents than men, uh, and he sought out the horrible furnaces of the place, and things having been begun from the beginning, he prepared a suitable space for a habitation after he had uprooted the brush and drained the pools. So it means that what was uncultivated and dangerous, he transformed into beautiful and pleasant. So this locus horribilis became locus amenus also. So it, it's the paradox of the place. But so far, I have just presented you the, these two topoi, and uh, which, which had been used for description of the landscape in the Middle Ages. And I have presented the connotations which they could have. And I'm just here, I'm just suggesting that these connotations might be also reflected in, um, and might be resonate within the medieval pilgrim's perception of the landscape. So it could be while he was moving through nature, he might be thinking about this kind of ideal paradise which has been created by God, or might be reflecting also upon this biblical wilderness, like this place of disobedience, testing, but also redemption, like, uh, but also redemption. And both of these sites have been perfect for contemplation, and therefore, and this dialogue with the God, and I think that therefore it's important to also, before we start to like try to analyze the object within this kind of experience of nature to return to do, to do this re detour uh, for the questions of natural contemplation. So if it was truly like possible to conceive God there only with, within the nature alone and how can we imagine and what did, what did it really mean because it's like interesting topic. I don't know. Well, so I think well, when I was searching for the answers for this, I found again the Cappadocian Fathers, which again, as I've said, there was the first hermits who would go into the desert and contemplating about nature, they would try to find the, the answer to this. And uh, I think the Gregory of Nazian Nazianzus is one of the m most interesting of those. But for him, the harmony in nature uh, is the tangible proof of the God's existence. It is the proof that uh, he is maintaining cause of all things. And this harmony, or through this harmony, he believed, or through the visible things and their order, that the human mind reasons back to their author. But this reasoning back uh, does not mean that we can perceive his essence or nature. It's, it's too far. The, for Gregory, there is anything in this world which could help a human mind to do so. Uh, in the words of Gregory of Nyssa, another one of the Cappadocian fathers, we perceive his power extending through all things, and yet do not say that he is any of those things in which he is. It's like the paradox of the creation. The God just uh, concealed and revealed himself within it. He's just, yeah, he's just there somewhere, just hanging. No, <laughs> no but, uh, but even though we cannot, we cannot perceive the nature in our essence, it is activities and energies which we can somehow in the, in the mind of Cappadocian fathers reach. This is the base of Cesarea's text, and he says that by the beauty of visible things, let us raise ourselves to him who is above all beauty. By the grandeur of bodies, sensible and limited in their nature, let us conceive of the infinite being whose immensity and omnipotence surpass all the efforts of the imagination. So, well, these texts, I think, are full of this kind of insufficiency and limitation uh, which we might feel in front, which they felt, in front of the Mysterium Tremendum. And this kind of uh, emotions, of course, led to kind of melancholy, poetic one. And uh, in front of, of course, of in, when they were fronting also the nature alone, in the nature which is in which uh, he, is manifest, he manifested his presence without violating his unknowability. So just, I'm using these paradoxes because it's the paradoxical situation which every, like, every, every one of those try to, try to solve. But I think that this melancholy uh, is presented in some of those texts. And this one is like the poetic and melancholy is just the write, writing of Gregory of Nazianzus. I'm just going to read it because I think it's really Beautiful. 
So for yesterday, worn out with my grief alone, I sat apart in a shady grove, knowing my heart out. For somehow I love this remedy in time of grief, to talk with my own heart in silence. And the breezes whispered to the note of the songster birds, and from the branches brought to me sweet slumber, though my heart was well nigh broken, and the cicadas, friends of the sun, chirped with the shrill note that issues from their breasts, and filled the whole grove with sound, a cold spring, hard by bedewed my feet, as it flowed gently through the glen, but I was held in the strong grip of grief, nor did I seek out of these things, for the mind, when it is burdened with sorrow, is not fain to take part in pleasure. So, after this just ex poetic exclamation of Gregorius, I think we can sum up that this approaching God through nature was possible, but only in the limit, 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 lim, with, with its own limits, of course. Only we can approach its energies and activities, and that's it. And then, well, in the eyes of those fathers. And it was, of course, limited by creation itself, and of course, which also encompass the nature of a human being alone. So, but the question is, how was it in the West? I'm not like any specialist on this, so I'm just, I don't know, using these texts. But it was also Augustine who was interested in it, of course. And he's asking the earth, are you God? And the, the earth is answering, well, I'm not. And all things that are on her did confess the same. We are not thy God, seek higher. I asked the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, and with a loud voice did they exclaim, he made us. My question was the inquiry of my spirit, the answer was the beauty of their soul. So it seems that this attitude, this is actually what also the Gregory of Nyssa is writing, which the text I was quoting to you, the Gregory wrote, he is any of those things in, we, in which he is. And so again, it's the paradox which was also felt by Augustine. I don't know, uh, but it seems that a natural feature, same as the mind of a man, uh, were just the visible mirror of invisible. And here I'm just referring to the words of St. Paul, Paul uh, to the Corinthians where he's writing, for we see now through a mirror obscurely then face to face. Now I know in part and then I shall fully know as also I was known. So. Again, here we are, it's just the, just the somehow, not essence and nature, but really just some different kind of perception of whatever God could be. And I think it, that the, these things uh, in the, for example, words of Bernard of Clairvaux, which we know, might be somehow perceived also in their opinion through this nature. And here we have the text, which is the letter to Henri Murdoch, uh, in which the Bernard of Clairvaux is saying, believe me who have experience, you will find more by laboring amongst the woods than you ever will amongst books. Woods and stones will teach you what you can never, never hear from any master. So I think that this concept of natural contemplation uh, was in the minds of, of, of both of Western and Eastern fathers you know, and monks. And, um, and I, it, it seems also that this kind of natural contemplation was possible in both the eastern desert but also in the western forest. Uh, but it is important, I think, to, un, to at least uh, acknowledge this alternative way to access holy before we will try to understand what churches and cathedrals like meant in this world. Uh, <clears throat> churches and cathedrals which, which provided this kind of holy through the sacraments. And, and I think that also what I've said, it also put there the, the questions of whether the pilgrim would, a pilgrimage would be very necessary. Why would you go to the holy place when you can like perceive something like that also in the nature? And it is connected to the questions which Michele Baci also like touched on Monday when he was saying that uh, how could on earth places become, become holy. And, but it's another complex topic. I, just, I cannot, again, just deal with it by my own. But uh, what is clear what happened with these holy sites is that the, the, the sacred has been structuralized. There, there was this kind of uh, hierarchy created within the sacred and also within the paradise. So, and I think this is idea which we, might, we must uh, have in mind 
when we will, especially when we are dealing with this kind of idea of the church on the horizon or cathedral there. So, uh, so what actually a pilgrim could perceive there when he was looking at this? <clears throat> the cathedral, church, or whatever, or such an image could uh, ha and bear a cultural, economic, and social significance, of course. The pilgrim could also think of the, how beautiful it is that he can orient himself thanks to this uh, long-distance view, that he can just follow the straight line. But uh, what I'm speaking today here about is somehow the interconnection of, of this structure with, its, with, with the nature and um, what kind of like, meaning can be deduced from it. So I've said to you that this, I have been arguing that, that, that the locus horribilis and locus, uh, that these kind of descriptions of, the, uh, of, of a landscape, of a nature, with, or the the uh, description of a nature in medieval times for which has been used these kind of topoi, locus amenus and horribilis, and their connotation they bore, uh, they were really important, or they were reflected within the perception of nature alone, of a medieval man. But, uh, and it is important to take this into consideration when we want to understand the object there. So, within the frame of nature, understand as locus amenus, as a kind of paradise, uh, well, we could comprehend this structure as culmination of hierarchy of holy and paradise. So, in this hierarchical sense, so the paradise of outer space was separated from paradise of the church itself by core. In the same way, that paradise of church was divided from paradise of monastery by church walls. And in the same way, that paradise of monastery was separated from this paradise of the landscape or nature, nature around. So it was just the culmination of the paradisiacal site. Uh, church would become a harmonious improvement of an earthly paradise. And within the framework, within the frame of nature understood as a locus horribilis, it would be also improvement, but in a diff completely different sense. It would be really contrasting. It would be a site uh, which would be a visible sign of protection uh, of a pilgrim from temptation, testing, and danger of the wild beasts and demons which were in the wilderness from which he would, you know, uh, arrive. Uh, it would be garden in the desert. And I think that with this, it, it also needs to be said that this kind of protection, as Sabina said yesterday, is not really confined only to the monastery or the borders and the walls, but it can be also emanating into the, into the broader area. So in the sense that, that the crosses which we might find around, this, uh, in the, which actually just demarcated the territory also of the church, uh, or territory of the church which, which a pilgrim could also see, uh, have been really important. And also the, the, the sound of bells, which, which also could bear this protective power. In fact, thanks to the study of Car Caroline Goodson, we know that on the bells there has been often written uh, inscriptions such as I torment demons, I break lightning, um, like the protective power against natural, natural powers as well as against mm -hmm. these demons of wilderness. So uh, actually a pilgrim who would be walking and just maybe uh, hearing the sound and just seeing the cross or, or just viewing uh, the, 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 the bell tower in the distance, he might be also like, he might understood that he's like Moving from one of the one of the from the wilderness into this like paradisiacal site, which is in its own then hierarchized, um, that uh, he would be leaving the wilderness to enter the harmony and protection of a locus amenus. And I think that might be it. I just. Mm, Yes, so the, the, con the conclusion or the, the things which I think is the most essential in this is the fact that without understanding nature, I think there would be no understanding of, of, of the object within it. And of course, it's like much more broader topic than I can cover. But at the same time, this kind of uh, understanding it through these connotations of, of literature, topo, I think at least it's an it's a approach which could really partially take us a little bit closer to it. 
and the church and through it we can really understand the church or cathedral or whatever there is not whatever but ecclesiastic, ecclesiastical like building maybe uh, as this improvement either in the harmonical sense and hierarchical one uh, or in this really contrast contrasting way as a side of protection and i think that's it That's it. That's it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we can start the discussion. Uh, yeah. Um, are there any immediate questions? Katharina, please. I have a question. When you were talking about the Christopher and you mentioned that from her lyrics, uh, it was like, possible for human involvement. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, actually, there, there are these stories. Uh, I think it was possible to create like wilderness around, but uh, I would, uh, I cannot now like tell you like the specific. But there are the stories, and I can, I will happily show you to this afterwards. No, but uh, no human. No, I, I mean, why it would be conceived like badly, but it depends on on the it depends on the idea which is behind this kind of cultivation. I mean, I, I've, I've I've read something with this, like that the monasteries were creating some kind of uh, the wilderness around them, but uh, the reasons behind I'm just liking now, so I'm sorry. No. But I I will show you after. But hmm. no, it's I don't. It was I, maybe I've said it also at the end a little bit. Because it's important to realize that these kind of notions must have been like really like overflowing each other. I, I don't know. It's really the question of perception, which is always, I think, really difficult one. But yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, it would be really interesting. And I think in this sense, it could work, really. But I mean, for example, yeah, I remember the discussion that we had about the, uh, the portal there in, or portal there in Lausanne, I think. You, you were trying to understand. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think it could work, especially if, if you could. But it's, it's again the problem because you don't, you, because this this also the idea of something which is wild or something which is paradisiacal. It's connected to a different kind of uh, like aspects as weather. I don't know. I cannot. I can imagine like the pilgrim who would be walking in the snow, arriving to this kind of portal. In the snow, just snowstorm, and realizing that he's finally really happy in this fa like s paradisiacal site of of whatever church has to offer. But so yes, I, I think it could work, but it's like really, again, complex in, in this sense that... What about the survey like, of the local conclusions or the no, uh, entering into this dialogue with the natural spaces and the space which is made by, by, by men? I don't know. No. It's like, you know, and like nature and cultivated one, you mean again? No. But also the local for example, you see both of them, supposed to be paradise because it's the garden no. of the paradise and the other hand is absolutely closed so there's also a lot of conclusion so you have the two top of it 
just proposed inside of the sacral space of the monastery. Yeah, but th this is connected with the, the hi this hierarchy of the sacred, I think. That's, yeah, monastery there is, in the monastery itself has been sometimes referred to as a paradise. And in it you have this, uh, this uh, how do you say, the court, right? The paradisical court. And in it you have the church and then the paradise of the altar itself. So it's like this hierarchy of creation of then and then on. So yeah, it works like that. My question is a completely early one, but mm -hmm. maybe it's not too far. Because, well, you spoke about the top one, mm -hmm. the perception of the intellectual one, because of course yeah. you don't have testimony from persons who are walking the countryside, but still we have those top points. But mm, what about the use of those top points into the concrete construction of the buildings? What I mean, mm. yeah. on one hand, uh, we know that each mechanic church it's a respectable mm. one, it's on the top of a hill mm. because it's supposed to protect. But we have other constructions we are, that are, are not on top at all. The case of Konak. Yeah. The Konak are open in the direction of Valley. Well. So, my first part of the question is do you think that we can really try to read it the way in which the building is integrated to the paradise, mm. in the countryside or in the horizon through this, let's say, protective and or integrative key? And, uh, in this direction, going of course, the second stuff which we discuss in um, in Saint Benoit, for example, we know for sure that people arriving to Saint Benoit were welcomed by a kiss of mm -hmm. welcoming into the liminal zone of the tower or town, and uh, this kiss was supposed to be also an exorcism. So, in order to enter the locus Amelius or the paradise mm -hmm. of the church, you have to be purified. So, this is this double game: the protection on one hand by the, the building himself. On a very special spaces, by the way, of the, the previous pagan presences. Mm. And on the other hand, the fact that even if you're arriving in San Luis Square plant, you have to be purified before entering the church. No, this this was really interesting because actually the, this tower, this the, the, the and the the columns which are created there, it re really reminds some kind of like this forest or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but. I mean, this is this is very difficult question because you would have to study like each and every like individual case. I think, for example, Mont Saint Michel, the the idea of the island and this and the liminal liminal uh, liminal position or liminal connotations of the sea, there might be something really connected to it. And I think this in this case it would be possible to read it in this sense. And also maybe the idea, but of course with Mont Saint Michel we know that. Uh, it's also connected to this cult of Saint Michael and whether there was some pagan structure before or not. So it's like really, uh, but I think in some sense it, it, it could be it could be reflected into this like structuring the architecture, of course. Why not? Because it was the cultural background. I think of the people who were, uh, who'd be think who would be creating these these structures. Mm -hmm. hmm? Just thinking that the Gargano the inscription on top of the church, the Horribilis Locus, uh, has this, uh, because mm. it's also connected to the wildness and mm. uh, sacralization of, uh, I think, and, I'm not, and I don't know if the inscription is uh, medieval or just later, but so maybe it could be multiple ways to look at this concept, maybe. Mm. Mm. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's very interesting also what you are, the material and how the, how the picture or construction of the Middle Ages go through the needle year of the mm. 19th century, of course, yeah. and then there is kind of wasteland. I mean, not really, but yeah. it becomes very, very difficult. I think one idea I have is uh, to, I think you did it, but still you might stress it a little more. Um, first, the difference between nature and landscape. I mm. mean, the landscape yeah. is something I would say in a very a rather conservative way, uh, before Petrarch there is no landscape. Yeah. I mean, it's not true, of course, but we should discuss it. Yeah? Mm. And, uh, so landscape would be a kind of, uh, of, of, of a heroic gesture of, of inventing something, and you have to be above it, <laughs> and otherwise, and you have to reflect it, of mm -hmm. course. It's not, it's not enough to just describe it, you have to in a way eat it, see? Mm -hmm. okay? And uh, nature, I mean, in, in, in a Christian theological sense, is evil because it's not, in, you see, in paradise there's not nature, there's 
Gan Eden, the, 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 the garden, and, and, yeah. and, but it's not, it's not nature itself. So this is, I think, uh, perhaps a, a methodological uh, yeah. problem you, you could work on. on yeah. um, and I mean, the answer Robert Curtius, you mentioned twice the three locus, locus amenus, uh, I think it's a good point. He was mainly, of course, in, in comparative literature, so mm -hmm. it's, you can combine it with your uh, pictorial material, and it would be interesting how you could do it. And I think one, the last thing I would like to remark, um, I'm not so sure whether, the, if I understood it mm -hmm. correctly, you compare or equal, equal yeah. uh, the, the eastern desert with the western forest. forest. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not. Um, I think the, the, at least the, the, the symbolism or mm -hmm. the, the imaginaire of the, of the forest, it, you cannot simply compare. Yeah. Because I would ask, rather say desert and sea, but perhaps there are more sea, uh, mm -hmm. uh, constructions which are possible and I mean one really good book on, on, on forest uh, is George Harrison's not the people mm -hmm. the guy from Stanford uh, <laughs> on it and, and it's really it, it's good yeah because I, it, it, I mean it's, it's it's too late for you <laughs> yeah. no, it's never too late but yeah. it's no I understand in the beginning it has to push you so it's good yeah you, you're going of course you're going back so, so to say oh, I mean back this where? I would I would I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a methodological question to most of you. Yeah. Uh, you are going back, I suppose. You are not progressing in the way that you are starting in antiquity and then go up and up. I think it's, it makes more sense, in, at least for a lot of the questions you have, to start in the now yeah, and then somehow try to, to make trajectories uh, back. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Starting from the present, going to yeah, the yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, the methodology. Mm. Mm. It's, 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 it's we, we in the project we are now finishing this rephrase: the present and the past. <laughs> okay. 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 No, no, but I, yeah, I had the same issues from like methodologically, and I don't know. It was very big, very difficult for me to grasp this all, like the subject, how to really, to, I don't know, as and. It, as an artist, history and it's like, for me it was a little bit difficult and it's true that I, I will have to work on it still and this idea of the forest and desert yeah it's it's I maybe should talk about it a little bit in more more clearly but uh, but yeah, the wilderness and how it is being like transformed from <laughs> one geographical location to another and the biblical connotations might be still I think a little bit a little bit sane in this oh, sense. Okay. Maybe the monastic literature, that's the problem. If you need the monastic literature, let's say, in the 12th century, uh, they are in this paradoxical situation because they are living in the middle of the West, so between forest and Greece, and they are using texts from the Father of the Desert. Okay. And so they are sometimes really applying the, the, the topos of the desert to the forest because they cannot be into the forest, but still they want to reuse or reflect on the writing of those authorities of the early Christian period. So there is this also gap between the early Christian, but we discussed it a bit with Martin, which is also interesting that if you will see the main text he was quoting, mm -hmm. they are all third, fourth, beginning fifth century. Mm -hmm. And then those texts yeah. are reused. Mm -hmm. And in a certain sense, the main idea are present for the rest of the Middle Ages. So what is done between Augustine, Gregorius, and so on, is something which will remain. And so there is this question of updating ancient concept to the new reality. So, but I agree that it's more complicated. We cannot just say that the forest is desert. But that the forest can be the desert, I would say yes. The forest for the monk is like the desert for the monk. The contemplation of the nature, the contemplation of the space, and the, the contemplation of the divinity through stones and through I, I, I would tend to be in this direction also because if you see how we are constructed, I mean, there was a big presentation years ago in, uh, in Prague mm -hmm. about uh, Benedictines, which are like cultivating Bohemia. And it was mm -hmm. mainly, that was the issue. When they were arriving into the forest 
and on one hand, it was their desert, because they went there in order to convert the ground mm -hmm. into the desert. And then they start immediately to transform the landscape mm -hmm. from forest to countryside. Mm -hmm. Which the desert fathers never did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's they, they, an they, indifferent they, they, Because they had also this, let's say, almost pre-modern way of constructing the world, so you have to yeah. change the world and create something different. But their text references was the generation before. So we are between the reality, the discourse, and then something else, the third step, which is creating this complexity. But, uh, well, yeah. it's obvious also these people are really positive and negative. Yeah. And also, in a certain sense, I would say that we live it also in a certain sense, because this harmony of nature is combined with all the difficulties of the nature that we are enforcing. It, and then you have the church, which, which is the answer. Because you're arriving to the church and you're sure to don't take any rain, yeah. to don't be like in the freezing cold. And starting from those practical aspects, you are like arriving to a place of protection and security. Yeah. And security. yeah, just um, um, you're right, definitely. May I say it? Yeah, of course. Not yeah. just, not just this discussion between the two of us. But I think. Uh, I mean, you're very on the side of the text. Mm -hmm. Why not go on the side of the pictures we have? So like uh, illustrations of manuscripts and how mm -hmm. uh, yeah. landscape comes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, I mean, oh. please forgive me, just <laughs> I, I'm more closer to, to Elias Canetti than to Gregor von Nazianz. <laughs> <laughs> then, then the forest is, of course, Figures a lot of other things like army, mass. I mean, not holy mass, but a lot of people, which I think is, is also part of the. It's not an invention of a guy from Bulgaria who, who ended in Vienna and uh, in Zurich, so to say. I think I would, in a way, recommend uh, to, to take other approaches into yeah. it. Yeah, the, the problem of images, I think, I've, my bibliography has been like not optimal. I agree, but the, what I, the problem of the, bibliograph of, of the bibliography and the images is that really the, it's the problem of art history as, and the formal analysis because no one was dealing with this kind of landscape and nature, nature this depiction. No, because they've said that they just condemned sometimes, and, and some, some, some scholars would condemn this kind of images as not really uh, I don't know, this that's not really, I don't know, just even worth to care. And they would say that the mid Middle Ages were not really the central period, that people were not, as if they were not looking at the nature. So I think that was also the problem that illuminations and, and this stuff has been like just pushed aside. But I agree that... This is the question of the reality of the images which we have. I mean, um, with, I mean, on one hand, I cannot accept that Petrarca is the first who is looking. Mm, yeah. Because in Africa, he goes to the hill, the hill and he's looking the countryside, the landscape, and he's telling for the generation who will arrive. But I cannot believe that Petrarca is the first who is looking, although it's right that if you are looking, especially in manuscripts, before Petrarca, yeah. the landscape, pictoricity, yeah. it's incredibly Let's say from the end of late antiquity and until the 14th century, I would say that the images are not helping mm. us a lot in understanding the countryside. Of course, you have the creations uh, from Montreal to 9th century manuscripts of the creation where the countryside is in certain sense present, but this is really like a very large, yeah, mm. and synthetic. Synthetic, I would even say. Mm. You have a piece of land, one tree, is done. Mm. I don't know. I think correct, but I, I, don't, I think cannot remember now a uh, tree like view into the countryside. And that's from the 5th century on. There are, of course, some exceptions, manuscripts, imperial, Byzantine stuff, but from, from the Latin West, it's something which is really like far. I, 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 I was writing about it once and I call it the triumph of la figura. So the figure who is triumphing mm -hmm. and the nature who is appearing. In a certain sense. So that's a part of the problem. Mm. This is the reason why we have to. Stay. If you are dealing with the 12th, 13th century, 11th, 12th, and 13th century, you don't have to go to the countryside. Or yes, you have it, but just in a very late. Yeah.
March and we're synthetically symbolic and also with uh, delivering a meaning, a message more symbolic than uh, even if you think that Lorenzetti is countryside, it still delivers a message of order and it's very late. It's very late. Lorenzetti is one of the first we depicted and you we first at least the house of the 14th century, but the right to the 15th. So that's something which is a bit limitation on the other hand. And that's why I, I gave to make Martin this difficult subject is that if you're walking <laughs> and you see stuff like that or uh, Bezley, it's evident that they are yeah. looking on the landscape and that they are creating a dialogue between landscape and building. Just to put it on the top of the hills, you can say it's practical for defense reasons or visibility, okay, but still. In, 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 in the Basel, there is a really huge mise en scène of the holy through the game in the landscape. So they are doing it, but we still don't really, really like in the methodological terms, we have something missing because we can observe the planet and we saw it, I mean, meeting almost each of our churches. If you're right walking, you see that there is a dialogue very close between the object and the, and the landscape. But then architecture is would be the question. Okay? There would then be a uh, dialogue between the church, mm -hmm. architecture, and uh, so to say the the, the mass of the mass of the mass of the, mass of the pilgrims or the group of the pilgrims. And still, there's the question: uh, what the role of the of the text of the commentaries to the holy scripture? What is indeed? I mean, see. Uh, when I was listening uh, every morning uh, to Michele, most of the things he spoke were, were liturgical prayers or hymns or, or songs. Perhaps they are more important than these very uh, uh, learned references. I mean, of course, some intellectuals were wandering, like you, but also others were wandering. And I, I, I would say, uh, we talked about it yesterday, that in order to, 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 to come through this hard labor of walking for weeks, you have some kind of, I call it with the other uh, techniques of ecstatic, ecstatic techniques, see? and singing in a group loud, I mean, it's, it's one of the ways, yeah, of course, because you, 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 you're kicked out, you, uh, you're spaced out, so. And I think uh, this may be also an important aspect of the whole thing. That's right, maybe liturgical text. Perhaps you are too much yeah. in the 19th century. Yeah, I think so. It might be possible, but... No, yeah. but the, the, to see the liturgical... Because there is an addition of one very great way, the singing of the pilgrims going to Santiago. Mm -hmm. And I heard it when I was very nice, but I never took the time to read the text. And I mean, it could be interesting, but I was supposed to really see what kind of texts they are. Mm. No, yeah, but the text is nonsense. No, 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 no believe me, <laughs> the, the liturgy of singing, you can sing Hänschen Klein and Martha Stella Haas, of course not, but it's secondary. We have, it's, I think, sorry to say, it, it's too much uh, on, on the text. It's, it's a technique, and, and this, you should, you should, I will, from the humble, my last remark, <laughs> uh, I think this corporal activity is very, very important. Okay, well, when the camera will be off for uh, singing, what you learn? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think we can make this for break for five minutes and then we'll see you with the other one.